Welcome to the Alain Guillot Podcast, a podcast about life, leadership, and money matters. Our guest today is Brandy Schilacci. Brandy is an author and editor-in-chief of BMY Medical Humanities Journal. And today we will speak about her new book, Mr. Humble and Dr. Butcher, A Monkey's Head, The Pope's Neuroscientist, and The Quest to Transplant the Soul. Brandy, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. So, Brandy, my first question is, is this book for real? Is this science fiction or something that's going to happen sometime in the next 50 years? I, I have a hard time discerning that. I know. It, yeah, it it's, is, it's nonfiction. It's, it's all, all of the things in the book actually happened. Uh, and they happened kind of a long time ago. Okay. Wow. Yes. Yes. So uh, it's, it's, it's just my head has been expanded <laughs> a few inches since I started reading your book. Uh, I wonder if we could start with a little bit of background information about you because you live in the fringes of many intersections of science and, and, and way of being. So can you just give us a little bit of, of background about your story? Absolutely. So uh, I think life is more interesting at the intersections sometimes. And so I I have in my life been a professor. I was a tenure track professor in a literature department. I also worked for a history department and for a museum of medical history. And I'm a freelance writer. Now I'm an editor of a medical humanities journal. So in a lot of ways, um, I don't think that, you know, for, for me, it's not about just looking at medicine or health or history or literature or narrative, but looking at all of those things in how they connect together. And so you sort of begin to understand how all of these pieces influence one another. You, you have to know the history of, say, health and medicine in order to know where things are going in the future. You also need to understand communication and literature and narrative in order to communicate properly these, this information to other people. And for me, um, social justice is a big part of that too. How do we make sure health and well-being are accessible to as many people as possible? And all of that kind of um, comes together for me in, in my own background in history. I, I grew up quite uh, poor and my parents were ill a lot. And in the United States, there's not social medicine. And so, you know, my parents went bankrupt as a result of illness. And I worried about whether or not I would lose them as a child. And so it makes you very aware of mortality, of health, of social policy, and how all of those things work together. So I suppose my career has kind of taken a similar path in the sense that I'm not ever in one field, but always kind of, uh, I ran an anthropology, a medical anthropology journal. Now I run a medical humanities journal. I've been in a history department, a literature department, an anthropology department. I'm, I'm kind of in all of these different places. Um, and now I'm not actually at a university at all, but I'm a freelance writer who writes about these topics instead. Okay. And well, you come from a poor background, as you mentioned, your parents were poor, uh, but you have accumulated a whole bunch of titles or at least expertise. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us from the moment you were a young girl trying to decide what to do with her life? How, what is it that attracted you first? What was your first degree and how you managed to pay for all this? Because as you mm -hmm. mentioned, social justice in the United States, education is not accessible to no. everyone, unfortunately. No, it's really not. So um, some of it comes down to, I, I lived in the countryside and we had, uh, an, we lived in an underground house. So our house was actually under the ground. It was a basement with the roof on top. And we, we lived there, we lived near a cemetery. And when my parents were very ill, particularly my mother had cancer a few times, my father had several massive heart attacks. And when they were recovering, I used to listen at their door at night, worried that they might not still be breathing. And I, I started taking an interest in health literature. So I read a lot of history books, history about the Black Death, history about plague, history of all these different things. I was really interested in those topics. And um, I, was, I was also really fascinated by science. I really particularly liked physics and chemistry, but um, <laughs> I was discouraged from pursuing a career in those areas. I, had, um, I'm, I am uh, you know, a, a person who is 
female and I unfortunately had a professor who, or a teacher in high school who didn't think girls should do science. And so I was discouraged and I ended up having such um, a difficult time in his class that I didn't want to have to take his second class in order to go on in science and medicine. So I ended up instead gravitating towards literature and English and writing because I could at least write about the topics that I found interesting. So that's actually um, kind of how it began. I began interested. I wrote a lot of you know articles and essays and stories. And I went on to get a degree. I, um, I won scholarship and had a grant. And I went on to get uh, my bachelor's degree in English literature. And that's really where I, you know, I, I had that love of writing and I really learned how, how that worked. But my love of history and my love of medicine and science never went away. So I, I graduated, I ended up getting a job in finance uh, as a office manager and then as a marketing assistant. And I worked that job for a while, mostly to try and pay off my, my remaining student loans and things. Um, because my, again, my family weren't able to really help me out that much. They, they did everything they could, obviously, but, and I just realized business was not where I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. So I began applying to graduate schools and I ended up going to Case Western Reserve University to get my graduate degree. And because I'd started off in English, I thought, well, I guess I'll get it in English. But then um, a quirky thing happened while I was there. I, I kind of accidentally ended up writing my dissertation on history instead. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, I was in the English department. So I had this kind of strange medical health humanities dissertation that I wrote that um, really crossed over. And I was doing things in the 18th century, the 19th century, the 17th century. I was really looking at historical works about women's bodies and women's health and all sorts of things like that. So, and I'd have to say, I feel like this is a little bit of a, I don't know how exciting this is for anyone, but when I got a job as a professor, you would have thought, aha, she's found her way. But instead, <laughs> I felt like, no, this isn't where I belong either. I want to communicate with the public. So I ended up leaving um, my job and working for a history museum instead, because I really wanted to deal with people, with, with everyday people and being able to share this strange history, like how we treat diseases. It's fascinating how we do this and how much it's changed over time. And I wanted to share that with everyday people. And it's harder to do that in the, in the academy where you're only talking, say, to students or, or to other PhD colleagues. Wow, that's super interesting. I don't know how you say that that may not be interesting to other people. <laughs> I found it amazing. Uh, you know, the only time that I have seen an underground house is in the movie The Hobbit. I I've never seen <laughs> <laughs> I never seen one of those. I didn't even know they existed. Uh, it's like living in a bunker, kind of. And, and why is that? Why did your parents decide to live in an underground? Um, well, they bought it with the intention of building a cabin on top of it. So it would be sort of um, like a split level home. But then they were struck by all of this terrible disease and illness. And of course, you don't, I mean, if you're scarcely paying the bills for that, it's hard to, to do much more than that. So we ended up just living in the, in the, in the bottom part of the, of the house. Wow. And you speak uh, about social justice a minute ago, and I wonder why is it that the United States is the only industrialized country that doesn't have health care for regular individuals, that you have to either be attached to, a, I don't know, a corporation, or, mm -hmm. or otherwise you are struck out of luck? I have no idea why it's like that. I, <laughs> I'm going to guess that greed is involved. Um, I, I don't know. It's really tragic, in my opinion. And I've spent a lot of time and words arguing for social medicine in the United States. But um, it's, you know, I, f I feel like I can see its approach, but <laughs> we've just never quite captured it. And it's a real shame because, again, um, you know, my, my mother-in-law is another example. My mother-in-law put off having some tests done because she couldn't afford it and she ended up getting colon cancer and they didn't spot it early because she didn't go in for these tests because she couldn't afford it. So, you know, it's a really, it's very sad. And I, um, of course, it's, it's particularly bad if you're a minority in this country as well, because then you have all the other things, racism and prejudice working against you. Uh, the fact that 
Um, it, we have a much higher mortality rate among Black women for, say, birth rates. They, there's infant mortality and maternal mortality is very high, and it's not among white people. And you know for a fact that that is that has to do with racism. It, it isn't just a fluke. So you know you have all of these situations where you know the the accessibility to things we I, a common human rights, I think are really limited in this country. And it's uh, it's particularly bad. Usually I find when I tell my European colleagues what it's actually like um, <laughs> here in the United States as far as healthcare, they're frequently quite shocked um, and horrified. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm next door to you. I'm in Canada and I'm shocked and horrified as well because, <laughs> yeah. you know, I tell you here we have like a, a two tracks. We have private, uh, private care and public mm -hmm. care. And the difference, if I want to see a doctor today, I probably will go call my private clinic and I may have an appointment this afternoon. If I want to go to the public right. clinic, I may have to wait a week. You yeah. know? But, but I still, everyone has access to healthcare and you may have to wait in line a little bit longer, but it still is accessible and, and I see no no major discrimination among being black or white or whatever. I'm sure there is, but it's mm -hmm. not, it's not quite. I'm visible. sure it's not as endemic. It's, it's particularly bad in the United States. And some of that goes back again. This is a, a why history is important, right? A lot of these problems go back to historical injustices. Actually, I talk about organ transplant in my book. And one of the things I bring up is how fraught that was in terms of racial justice at, in the 1960s. So you have um, civil rights sort of butting heads with new medicine that uh, might not be taking the concerns of minorities very seriously. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, that, that comes along. And if you understand the history of where this country comes from, I mean, this country was built on slavery. Mm -hmm. That's still in our, you know, it's in the bones of this country. And that means racism is still a real big problem. Wow. Okay. I guess we are getting derailed a little bit. Uh, okay. So you have been writing a few books. Can you tell us about your previous work and, and, and yeah, what is it that uh, told you that you had to go ahead and write your first book? Um, so I had, I've always been, uh, I spent a lot of my time writing. And of course, if you're an academic, they want you to write uh, books as well, academic books. And so my very first book was actually um, an academic compilation that I did called, um, that was about history of birth and reproduction and things like that. But the first book I wrote, uh, it's my book, my um, a trade press book for the public, was on death and dying. And again, that, that comes out of my own personal experiences. And the book is a little bit, it is a history of cross-cultural grief rituals, but it's also a little bit of a memoir where I talk about how different um, the kinds of grief that I experienced in my family because my West Virginian side of the family did things very differently than people who lived in Ohio and in, in the northern part of Ohio where I live now. So for instance, they they stayed up with the dead. They washed the body. It, the body was in a house rather than in a funeral home. And that was quite unusual um, for uh, most American funerals are not run that way. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. Let's talk about that. Let's examine that. Why, why have we divorced ourselves from these intimate grief rituals and, and how, how death has become kind of hospitalized and grief has become pathologized. So that, that first book had to do with death and dying. And I'd already been writing some articles and essays about it when I was approached uh, by someone asking, you know, hey, maybe you should write that as a book. So I did. And that was my very first book that came out. And it came out in England first, actually, uh, and only in the United States, secondly. Well, interesting. And that's interesting too. Yeah, didn't people start um, separating uh, the or changing the burial rituals uh, after the Civil War when you had all these dead soldiers coming in and you had to prepare them and separate them? And I guess, I guess before the Civil War, people were just uh, hell in their house for, I don't know, visits and, and mm -hmm. see the court and all this and that? Um, it, a couple of things happened. One is uh, that we have, that, so embalming really embalming, picked up after the Civil War. And that, that was because you had to make sure people still looked like who they were by the time they got back home um, to be identified by their family, which is horrifying when you think about that. But um, the, the death rituals had been 
changing slowly over time. But then as we became more medically proficient, mm. that is actually what I think drove the biggest changes because um, medicine has become kind of a screen because nowadays if someone gets ill, we expect them to go to the hospital and, and they probably will die at the hospital and then you don't see them again until a funeral. And there, there's kind of a, a uh, it's very sterile. It's very, it's, it's someone else is taking care of it. Funeral directors and hospital people and all, all of these other things. Um, and the other thing is people don't, uh, well, okay, coronavirus has changed this, but we have come in the West to think that um, death comes only when you're really old, you know, whereas in, in previous times, um, the biggest mortality rate was actually people under the age of five. And so you, you saw death more often, death happened in your family more often, people had lots of children, but not all of them made it to adulthood. And we've, we've, we're sort of victims of our own success in a way we're so used to succeeding and, and thwarting death that we're almost unprepared to deal with it when it comes. And so that's partly what that book looked at was how, how is that different in other cultures and how was it different historically? Okay, well, let's then, let's talk about your new book, Mr. Humble and Dr. Butcher. Uh, what was the inspiration for this book? Uh, so I have a, while I was working on the death summer, things have gotten a little loud behind me. <laughs> I might have to shut that door. Okay. <laughs> Hang on one second. Okay. Um, while I was working on Death Summer Coat, I had a, a colleague who was helping me understand the concept of brain death, which is, you know, <laughs> hard to get your head around, really. And he's a neurosurgeon. And one day, a few years later, he called me and he said, hey, could you come down to my office? I have something really unique that I think, I think you should see. So I do. I go to his office and he, he basically gives me this notebook. And the notebook's very old and it, it looks like something you might um, use in a, in a school room, it's, it's got lines, and it basically has all of these notes in it about mouse brains and mouse heads. And I said, what am I looking at? What is this? And he said, well, that's the lab notebook of Dr. Robert White, who performed the first primate head transplant in 1970. And I didn't even know that this had happened. <laughs> so I was quite shocked to hear that anybody, that anyone had been thinking about transplanting heads, much less being successful at it. So I became really intrigued. And I thought, I have to find out more about this guy um, because he wasn't just some fringe scientist. He, he, he was nominated for a Nobel Prize at one point in his life. So I thought, okay, how do you reconcile these strange things that he did with somebody who's also clearly um, working for the greater good in medicine? Okay. Uh, uh, so <laughs> I was taking notes as you were talking. So you find this notebook and, and, and you find that interesting, but then what, how does that translate to you writing a whole book about it? <laughs> Well, it turns out that his daughter still lived okay. in the town uh, that I live in. And this is where Robert White was from, was here in Cleveland. And his daughter was really interested in having somebody write his biography. And she had all of this material. So, you know, at first I thought, well, let me just take a look at his life and see. But his life turned out to be so much more fascinating than I expected. So, for instance, he lived at a time when things were really changing rapidly. Um, civil rights, animal rights, the Cold War, you know, uh, things happening behind the Iron Curtain in Russia and, or the Soviet Union. And, you know, he lived through all of that, all of those changes, the assassination of Kennedy, um, changes happening abroad, uh, you know, sort of post-World War II all the way up into the year 2010 when he died. So he lived through this massive change where we began to be able to do things nobody ever thought of before, like Transplanting organs is something that we take for granted now, but is pretty strange. If you think about it, your heart can go in someone else's body and they can live. And that wasn't done until uh, the 50s. So, you know, White got in on this sort of ground floor. He was there at the, the hospital where the first successful kidney transplant was done. He was there as a medical student at the time. He saw it and he became fascinated by, well, what else can you transplant, you know? Um, what if your body was failing, but your brain was still really good? Was there a way that you could move 
an entire body over to your head and and keep on living and he he used um stephen hawking as an example of that and so uh it, it's a really peculiar idea and yet he was a brain surgeon and a brain scientist and he became fascinated with understanding whether or not your brain could outlive your body and i think that that's um kind of mind-blowing <laughs> it is it is and in a way since you mentioned stephen hawkins in a way he was just supported by machines his, mm -hmm. his brain was still functional his body was just gone uh, yeah but, and and, that, and why i'd like to use that as an example because his point was if your mind is still good isn't your life worth preserving even if your body can no longer support you shouldn't we do everything in our power to to save that life the life of that brain so even though on one hand the idea of giving someone a head slash body transplant seems frankenstein and macabre and science fiction his reasoning behind it was not that different from wanting to give someone a new heart or new lungs right so uh, then if he was successful how come this is a uh, mystery how come i had to find out through your book and it's <laughs> not in a, a normal procedure now like you know let's say right. i mutilate my body but my head still works why couldn't there be a transplant mm -hmm. right now so some of it comes down to the the big difference in science between what we can do and and what we should do um the ethics that are involved are, are really big here so he does prove that he he, he does this on monkeys on primates macaques he basically takes one monkey's head and he puts it on the body of another monkey and he <laughs> puts them back together in, in in order to make this work he had to super cool the brain of the monkey because otherwise um, depletion in oxygen can lead to brain damage. So he, that's actually how he developed the super cooling techniques or what they call therapeutic hypothermia, which is what he was ultimately um, nominated for a Nobel Prize for. So, uh, which is, you know, when you think about it that way, that's, that's fascinating. But he, he manages to make this work. He puts the monkey's head on another body. The body is providing all of the nutrients and blood and oxygen. The problem is um, you're paralyzed because you severed the spinal cord. So, you know, it, in that sense, you're not really able to function. The body's not able to function. So you're in the same position, say, as Stephen Hawking. You are still, the monkey was still functional. It could see, it could hear, it could, it actually tried to bite Dr. White after the surgery. So it lived for about nine days. And Dr. White said, okay, we can now perform this on human beings, but you know, who are you going to get to be the first person? <laughs> wow. Because whatever happens to you afterwards, you're going to be paralyzed. You're, there's not a high, you know, we don't know what the guarantee of success and survival rate is. So there's a lot of ethics wrapped in there too. Okay. So, uh, but still, this is something that uh, it was done in a monkey, but uh, it's still a possibility to do something. Some, some, it sometime absolutely in the is. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he, he actually had somebody who volunteered to be the first patient, um, Craig Vitovitz, who was a tetraplegic. He had been injured in a diving accident and uh, lost the use of his um, legs, arms and legs. And what had happened is with a lot of people who've been paralyzed, their organs start to fail over time. Mm -hmm. And so Craig Vitovitz's kidneys had begun to fail and he wanted to get uh, a transplant, but at the time they didn't consider him a good candidate because he was paralyzed. So, you know, for him to live on and he didn't want to die, he had children, he wanted to watch them grow up. For him, the head transplant or body transplant at that point sounded um, like a real possibility. And he worked with Dr. White, Dr. White actually prepped a surgery protocol in order to perform it on human beings. They located a brain dead person that they thought they could use that body. He even practiced the surgery on two corpses, two dead people, uh, which is something that's commonly done where they're practicing new surgeries. But in the end, they didn't get the approval or the money to make that happen. And you know, you can kind of understand why. On one hand, I, I understand Craig Vitovitz's point, which is, I want to live, I want to live a longer life. On the other hand, this is still a really dangerous surgery. There's no guarantee exactly how you'll come out on the other side. Like, are we just our heads? Are we just our brains? Because I know that I'm, I'm connected to my body and there's neurons and hormones and all kinds of other things that are wrapped up in, in making us who we are as people. So we're not quite sure what you'll be on the other side of that surgery. And a lot of people felt like it wasn't, 
uh, right for us to try and find that out. So ultimately it doesn't happen, but that doesn't mean that there aren't still people talking about it. And in fact, there's a, an Italian neurosurgeon named Sergio Canavero who is still trying to get permission to perform that surgery. And you think this is because we want to live a, a healthier life? I mean, if I have a bad liver, I, I will certainly like to have a, a liver that works better. But also, um, could it be that we are in a search for immortality? And, and you know, mm -hmm. if we can transplant a, a liver, why not give me a body of, a, I don't know, 20 year old men, if, if that's, that is, that's the a good point. Of the possibility. It's certainly some of the points that are made by Sergio Canavero. Um, Dr. White was, I think, thinking of it more almost like a life support system. But I, one of the things that came up a lot is people pointed out something which I think is, is really important. Um, we have a real shortage of organ donors. Mm -hmm. There's long lists for people to get organs. So if you give someone an entire body, that person could have given their lungs to someone, their heart mm -hmm. to someone, their kidneys to someone. So it's almost like saying, uh, if you could have performed five transplants with that body and you're giving the whole body to one person, are you saying that they are worth five people? So it, who, de who decides, who determines whether or not, uh, you know, who's worthy and, and why? And unfortunately, and I want to just take this back to my comments about accessibility of health, chances are good that the people who would be offered those kinds of surgeries would be people with a lot of money, a lot of clout, you know what I mean? And so in a sense, are you taking away organs from people who need them, who have more difficulty accessing them and giving them to people who can pay for it? So it, it becomes an ethical issue um, in a whole other way. If this were something that were being done all the time, it becomes kind of an, an ethical concern you know, just in the sense of who gets access and who doesn't. Right. Okay. Well, it, it all sounds, and you mentioned in the book that it's almost like the core word that there is a uh, race to uh, do this kind of transplant between the Western war and the Soviet Union. So, uh, so mm -hmm. where are they in this kind of experiment? Because uh, the way that we perceive it here, they have less ethical qualms than let's say here in, in, in the West. So uh, maybe here we care about this and that, how is it gonna feel ethically? But I, I think there's less concern <laughs> on the other side of the wall. <laughs> well, you know, um, Dr. White actually worked with people in this uh, form after the Soviet Union had fallen with people in different parts of, of the former Soviet Union. And he thought he might perform the surgery there at one point. His major concern was that it would be less expensive there, um, but he doesn't end up going forward. It's not happening there now. However, uh, Dr. Canavero's colleague who's helping him with head transplant is from China. And their um, Dr. Ren is his name. And most of the head transplant experiments are at this point happening uh, with animals, with, with lab mice and things uh, in China. It's not the only place that's working on them, but it is the place that Canavero has been uh, liaisoning with um, rather, than, rather than places in Russia. Okay, uh, this may be a little bit out of the scope of your book, but uh, where are we right now with harvesting organs coming from animals? Uh, I heard that you could, I don't know, uh, mm -hmm. take organs from a pig and transfer it to a human being. Is that something, I mean, I, I, I hear- You're in luck. I just, I just read an article about this so, uh, for Medium. Um, th yes, uh, they have been working on that. They've even been working on what they call chimeras, which is uh, attempting to put some human DNA into pigs and into monkeys to find out if it makes the organs more easy to transplant. Um, so far, none of that has led to any actual, um, not very many results. So to, despite how much you might try to put human cells into another creature, often the end result is there's less than 2% there. So it's not necessarily, um, it's, not, it's not the hybrid that I think the news sometimes makes it sound like it is. But uh, we have used pig valves before in heart surgeries. There are other means of that. More interesting, I think, to me, is that they're, they're now looking to see if there's ways of growing organs from stem cell tissue. And so that's a whole new industry that's rising um, partly uh, through efforts of cloning cells, um, stem cells cloning, 
were cloning animals. They cloned monkeys in China. They recently cloned a horse um, here in the United States. So, you know, the science has almost, I think, gone beyond head transplant and it's, it's moving in directions that Dr. White probably couldn't have foreseen. Wow. Okay. So a lot to digest here. Uh, <laughs> uh, I wonder if you could tell us one more time the title of the book and where can people follow you? And you have a funny uh, uh, Twitter feed. So yeah, mm -hmm. I do have, I have a lot going on on my Twitter feed. Um, so the worst, the, the most difficult part about finding me is spelling my name right. Um, I have a website, brandyskilache.com, and that's S-C-H-I-L-L-A-C-E. My Twitter feed is bskilache, uh, so it's at bskilache. The book is available at all purveyors. You can get it at your local bookstore. I always encourage people to go local first. Um, it's also available on Amazon. It's out in Canada, the United States, and Australia. will soon be out in the UK in June. So um, I really hope people are interested in getting it. It's called Mr. Humble and Dr. Butcher. A, and by the way, those are his nicknames. Um, he was called Dr. Butcher by PETA, and he called himself Mr. Humble. So Mr. Humble and Dr. Butcher, A Monkey's Head, The Pope's Neuroscientist, and The Quest to Transplant a Soul. Brandy, fascinating subject. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me.